chapter 3. So it can be found on page 1179 in the Pew Bibles. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 17 to 17. Sorry, verses 14 to 17. Page 1179. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All Scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Blessed be the word of the Lord. Thank you very much, Judy, and good morning, everyone. Uh, Let's pray, ask for God's help, that we might hear from him clearly this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word to us, that you have spoken clearly, that you haven't left us um, without without a word from you, without any information about you. You haven't left us to make up our own ideas, but instead you've communicated clearly with us. And so, Father, I pray that as we hear from your word this morning, that we would be encouraged and that we would love you more as a result. In Jesus' name, amen. In 1521, Martin Luther stood accused of heresy. And he was at an assembly in a place called Worms. Uh, And when you see it written down, it looks a bit funny because it says the Diet of Worms. Uh, But it's actually the Diet of Worms. And repeatedly, he was told that he couldn't believe, he wasn't allowed to believe what he believed. He had to change his mind. He had to agree with the church's teaching. He had the whole weight of the authority of the the church, which was basically the only church in the world at that time, or at least in the West, and they were telling him he needed to change his mind on his beliefs. And Martin Luther said this, Unless I am convicted by scripture and plain reason, uh, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils because they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. So help me God. Amen. Luther's collected works um, give the more famous version of this statement where he says, Here I stand, I can do no other, so help me God. Amen. What bravery. He didn't just stand against a few authorities, he stood against the Pope. Every bishop, the whole world, in fact. And he stood on the word of God as the only infallible source of truth. And it's because of him and similarly brave believers that we hold today to the words scripture alone. We believe that there is no counsel or pope or authority that can say this is the truth if those words cannot be found in Scripture or derived by good and necessary consequence from Scripture. Now, there may be things that are true that are not found in the Bible, but nothing that is required for life or godliness is not contained in the Scriptures. Everything we need for life and godliness is contained in the Word of God. And you might think to yourself, yep, Isaac, that's pretty basic stuff. I believe that. I've believed that for a long time. But I ask us the question this morning, do we really believe in Scripture alone? Do we really believe in Scripture alone? I wonder how many times we have gone to make a decision, an important decision, and we have consulted with our friends. We've consulted with people we respect. We've consulted maybe with the internet. But we have not consulted with God and his word. We'll seek advice. We'll go to a friend. And that's all fine and good. But has not the Lord called us friends? And we do not seek his advice. This morning, 
we're going to see why it is essential that we hold the Scripture alone. It's essential that we hold the Scripture alone and not just believe it, but actually practice it as well. And it's because Scripture is God-breathed and because it is everything we need for life and godliness. The first point this morning is God-breathed. Have a look again at verse 16. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And verse 17, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I wonder where you would begin if you were going to come up with a statement of faith. It's not something that we have to think about because we have these statements of faith, we have these confessions that have been handed down to us. Uh, But I wonder, where would you begin? If you're trying to summarise the Christian faith, where might you begin? Well, you might begin with Jesus. You might begin with the Gospel. But then you might think, well, if I begin with Jesus and the Gospel, the question might come up like, who is God? And so you might start with God. But when the Westminster Assembly convened in the 17th century, they had to think about this question too. They didn't start with the Gospel. The Gospel comes in chapters 8 to 12 of the Westminster Confession of Faith. They didn't even start with the doctrine of God. Which doctrine did the Westminster Assembly decide must come first? Which doctrine is the foundation for all other doctrines? Which belief must be communicated as of first importance? Well, the Westminster Divines decided that it was the doctrine of Scripture. And you can understand why that was. Without the understanding of the Scripture as our foundation for all things to do with life and godliness, then there is no basis upon which to understand who God is. Imagine, if you do not first accept that this is the Word of God, how can we know anything about Him? There's no basis, not only to understand God, but to understand who Jesus is. Without the Scripture, who are we to go to for information about Jesus? Or the gospel. If we are to learn anything about God, if we are to believe anything of substance, then the very first thing we need to believe is that God has spoken and his words have been written down for us. Now, of course, there are some things that we can know about God without looking to scripture. This is called general revelation. You can look out at the world and you can gather something, some information about God. You look at nature, and maybe you've done this. Um, sometimes, I don't know if you find this, but you're driving around the valley and you don't really take in the scenery. And then some, for some reason, something strikes you and you just look at like, actually, these, these hills are quite magnificent, really. I think it was last winter, um, there was some snow and on the, on the hills just out the back here. And I was in the car park at Woolies, and I'm like, oh, I don't really pay attention to these hills, but now that they've got snow on them, like they look amazing. The creation is amazing. It's fantastic and detailed. It is obviously, obviously the work of an incredibly intelligent designer. We can see that he is an incredible designer, our God. He must be powerful to create a universe as expansive as ours. And yet beyond that, we can't really know much else. We can't know about the Trinity from the creation. We can't know about a Messiah from the creation. It's only because of the scriptures that we can know about these things and that we can know that salvation comes by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Without that belief that God has communicated to us through his word, all we have are the opinions of ancient men. That's all this would be. And for many people, that is exactly what the scriptures are. I remember being challenged once um, by a skeptic. He said, you know, the Bible is really just a game of Chinese whispers. One person passes a message on to another and you know how that works out it never the real message never gets through and my response to him was you are absolutely right <laughs> if there is no god then of course particularly the old testament is just a game of chinese whispers 
But if there is a God, then it is understandable and reasonable that he would communicate in a way that we could understand and preserve information about himself. The foundation of our belief in God is a belief that this book is inspired, or in the words of Paul, God breathed. It's a very literal translation of what Paul says here. He seems to have crafted that expression expressly for describing what the scriptures are. The Bible is a book that God breathed into existence. It isn't the ravings of mere men. It isn't a collection of thoughts and ideas. The Bible is inspired by God. It comes from God. And every word of scripture is exactly as God wanted it to be. And yet, that does not mean that the authors of the Bible were sitting around and a voice would speak to them and tell them what to write down. God worked through individual authors and you can see through the scripture that there's very unique styles but the result what we end up with is God's word so that the scriptures are without error and yet are faithful to the style of each of the authors God used they are God breathed scriptures and it is because we believe that these scriptures have been breathed out by God that the word of God is not just a book. It's a living document. Maybe you've experienced this. You've been reading a passage that you're extremely familiar with. You've been reading a passage that you're familiar with. You maybe have read it four or five times. And then one time you're reading it and it just sort of leaps out at you. Something on the page just strikes you and you're, you're hit with like a fresh understanding of God. It's not a dead letter. It is a living document. God uses the words of Scripture to speak to us individually and uniquely. And yet, even if you don't have that experience, even if you don't feel anything, when we read the Scriptures, we are being fed by them. These words are like water on a parched tree for a parched tree. It's like finding bread in the desert. Maybe you saw a post by Christina Bear on Facebook and she was saying that she has a tradition in her family that when they go to to America, um, they take a child down the wonders of American greatness. (laughs) Every child has to witness and have this experience of seeing this glory of the United States of America and that is of course the cereal aisle in the supermarket now if you haven't been to America you might not be able to understand there are 20 times as many options for cereal in the United States as there are here and all of them are simply terrible (laughs) they're not food it's chemicals and corn syrup held together with soy and it's delicious (laughs) And even more than here, you have to really hunt for something that is worthwhile and actually good for you. Friends, we live in that aisle. Except instead of being full of cereal, it's full of information. And it's full of things that are vying for our attention. Nearly all of it is extremely bad for us. And that's exactly the thing that makes us want it more and more. But also in that aisle of information is a book with the words of life in it. That is real food. That will feed us, nourish us. That will lift our heads when we're down. That will inform us. That will guide the path of our lives and will even transform us by the power of the Holy Spirit so that we become more and more like Jesus. We believe in Scripture alone because it is the only thing that is God-breathed. The second and last point this morning is that it is everything we need. Have a look once more, verse 16 and 17. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Their first function of the scriptures is to teach good theology and rebuke bad theology. Now, we live in an interesting time. In ancient times, 
If you wanted to hear from a false teacher, they had to literally come to your town. We don't live in that time. If you wanted to hear good teaching, they had to come to your town too. We live in an unprecedented time where you can go on the internet, you can listen to John Piper's um, seashell sermon on a loop 24-7. It's a great sermon, by the way. You should have a listen to that one. (laughs) John Piper lives in Minnesota. It's about as far away from here as you can possibly get. And yet we can listen, we can watch, we can read sermons from him and others as soon as they are preached. You can watch sermons delivered live from the other side of the world. There has never been a time where it has been easier to get the truth of the gospel to people all over the world. And yet there has never been a time where it is easier for false teachers to spread their heresy. You don't have to look far on the internet to find a false teacher spreading that teaching for financial gain. At the time of the Reformation, the structure of the Catholic Church was used to propagate false teaching. These days, it doesn't need a structure. Thanks to the wonders of the internet, your sweet Auntie Lou can be getting the most sulfurous bad teaching this side of hell delivered right into her ears. In August of 2016, uh, Pastor Rabalongo in South Africa claimed that because Jesus walked on water, that he could do anything by the power of God and his own faith. And he attempted to demonstrate this by promising a poor woman in the congregation that she would feel no pain if if he put a very large speaker on top of her. And then he even sat on top of that after he told her to lie down. She suffocated. She passed out and sadly later she died of internal injuries. False teaching literally kills people. False teaching was rife at the time of the Reformation. It is rife today and the solution to the problem is the same. The word of God. You see, the reason false teachers seem to get away with it is because they are great in monologue. So long as they're the ones holding court and there is no one to challenge them, they do fine. So long as they can say their bit, quoting scripture out of context, they are fine. But bring someone along who can point out that the Bible says something different in context, then their arguments are destroyed. A good example is that is not that long ago, um, I heard a pastor in Hobart even claim that that Christians who aren't working miracles today or aren't speaking in tongues and prophesying are what Paul was talking about in, the, in chapter 3, where he says that these, uh, of this chapter, in verse 5, where he says they have a form of godliness but deny its power. Saying if you don't work any miracles, if you don't speak in tongues or prophesy, then you have a form of godliness but you deny its power. Now, who here has been working miracles lately? No hand. Oh, nearly had a hand. Do you want to talk about that? Get up. Do you want to take your goodbye spot? <laughs> None of us have been working miracles. Oh dear. Oh dear. You might be having a form of godliness, but denying its power. But if you look at verse is one and on, I won't do all of this, but have a look quickly at the beginning. But mark this: there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Is that about faithful Christians who do not work miracles? Absolutely not. It is about a person who has abandoned God, who has turned into a life of sin. The power it's talking about is not the power to work miracles, it's the power to live a godly life. Context will almost always undermine a false teaching and confirm a true one. So the first function of scripture is to teach good theology and to rebuke bad theology. That is the meaning of teaching and rebuking. It is useful for teaching and rebuking. But there is another function mentioned here, correcting and training in righteousness. They're two sides of the same coin. 
Instead of referring to doctrine, it's now referring to the way that we live. The scriptures correct our bad behavior and they train us in good behavior. If you want to know if an action is or thought is godly, then we only need to refer to the scriptures. If we're going to show someone else that their actions are not godly, then we should be able to prove it with scripture. And this is where the danger comes in, because there are many at the time of the Reformation and today that do not rely on scripture alone for information about what, is, what behavior is godly and what is not. They use all kinds of other sources for information about what is godly and what is not. There are many people that go off their feelings. Because I don't feel convicted about this thing that I'm doing, if I don't feel like it's bad, then it isn't bad. But you can do something completely sinful and not be troubled in your conscience about it. You can have a seared conscience. But there's another way that you can use information outside of the Bible to inform your behavior, and that is by using tradition. Tradition. To this day, the Catholic Church teaches that it is immoral, it is wrong for priests to marry. Nothing in the Bible suggests such a thing. In fact, you can see in history where it came along later, um, it was designed to prevent um, the children of priests inheriting estates from the church. It's not a scriptural thing. It's a tradition. And the result of adding tradition to scripture is confusion and misery. The purpose of scripture is twofold. It depends and equips our theology and it corrects and it trains us in righteousness. Whenever people go away, go astray rather, theologically or in their practice, you can bet that at the root of the issue is a denial of Scripture alone. At some point, we've said to ourselves, if we're going astray, the Bible is not enough. I need to add something else. I think there are ways that we can do this. Practically deny Scripture alone. If we were to do a sermon series, and I'll, Lord willing, I will never do this. Uh, if we did a sermon series based on a movie. You might not have come across that before, but it's an incredibly common thing to do. I think that is a denial of Scripture alone. You're saying that the Bible isn't interesting enough. We need something else to draw people in. We need something else to make the Bible interesting. Isn't that what happens when a church decides it needs to incorporate business techniques into evangelistic strategy? Or when it designs a church around people who don't believe? It's an admission that the Bible isn't enough. It's not denial of scripture alone. And we can be tempted to shake our heads at people who do those things. But I wonder, do we need to remove the log from our own eye? How often have we been in a trial and not turned to God in his word? We've needed comfort. And instead of turning to God's word, we've turned to food. Or alcohol. Have we done just about anything else in a time of worry instead of turn to the word of God? If we believe in scripture alone, then we will know that in it we can find everything we need for life and godliness. Scripture alone doesn't mean that everything that can be known in every area of life is contained in the scriptures. I do not recommend installing a high volume air conditioner according to the instructions you find in the Bible. That's not going to go well for you. The Bible doesn't tell us what sort of car to drive. The Bible doesn't tell us whether it's morally acceptable to support Carlton in the footy. It's not. That's a tradition. (laughs) The Bible doesn't even tell us specifically which words are unacceptably coarse. And which words are okay. 
Imagine how massive the Bible would have to be if it covered every single circumstance. Well, it would have to be as long as the law is in our state. And imagine how impossibly locked the Bible would be to the first century if it tried to cover every single circumstance. Instead, what the Bible does in most areas is it gives us principles to apply in every area of life. And what Scripture alone does mean is that everything required, everything that is truly necessary for life and godliness is contained in this book. Wisdom can be found in any number of places, but when it comes to things that we genuinely and truly need to live godly lives, to run godly churches, to be godly husbands and wives and children, is contained in the Scriptures alone. And if we don't think it is enough, it's probably because we don't know the Scriptures well enough. Scripture alone. It's the basis of the Protestant religion. It is a defining feature of our theology. Catholics don't believe in it. Mormons don't believe in it. And sadly, there are many evangelicals, genuine brothers and sisters, who don't believe in it either, Because they put on equivalent with Scripture their own private revelations, thoughts, and traditions. And confusion is the result. But if we want to be people of the book, if we want to avoid confusion, then we need to hold firmly to Scripture alone. Scripture alone. And like Martin Luther say, here I stand, I can do no other God help me. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that we might stand firmly upon it. No matter what comes our way, what challenge from the world, what challenge from religious people, that we would say, no, that the word of God is our firm foundation. Father, I pray that we wouldn't be tossed about by the winds of culture, but instead hold firm to the truth of your word. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you have communicated with us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.